Volume One, Letters One through Six of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brook. Letters One through Six, read by Kit Nusis as Edward Rivers, Alan Mapstone as John Temple letter one to john temple esq at paris cowes april the tenth seventeen sixty six after spending two or three very agreeable days here with a party of friends in exploring the beauties of the island and dropping a tender tear at carisbrook castle on the memory of the unfortunate charles the first i am just setting out for america on a scheme i once hinted to you of settling the lands to which I have a right as a lieutenant-colonel on half-pay. On enquiry and mature deliberation, I prefer Canada to New York for two reasons, that it is wilder and that the women are handsomer. The first, perhaps, everybody will not approve. The latter, I am sure you will. You may perhaps call my project romantic, but my active temper is ill-suited to the lazy character of a reduced officer. Besides that, I am too proud to narrow my circle of life and not quite unfeeling enough to break in on the little estate which is scarce sufficient to support my mother and sister in the manner to which they have been accustomed. What you call a sacrifice is none at all. I love England, but I am not obstinately chained down to any spot of earth. Nature has charms everywhere for a man willing to be pleased. At my time of life, the very change of place is amusing. Love of variety and the natural restlessness of man would give me a relish for this voyage even if I did not expect, what I really do, to become lord of a principality which will put our large acred men in England out of countenance. My subjects indeed at present will be only bears and elks, but in time I hope to see the human face divine multiplying around me, and in thus cultivating what is in the rudest state of nature, I shall taste one of the greatest of all pleasures, that of creation, and see order and beauty gradually arise from chaos. The vessel is unmoored, the winds are fair, a gentle breeze agitates the bosom of the deep, all nature smiles. I go with all the eager hopes of a warm imagination, yet friendship casts a lingering look behind. Our mutual loss, my dear Temple, will be great. I shall never cease to regret you, nor will you find it easy to replace the friend of your youth. You may find friends of equal merit, you may esteem them equally but few connections formed after five-and-twenty strike root like that early sympathy, which united us almost from infancy, and has increased to the very hour of our separation. What pleasure is there in the friendships of the spring of life, before the world, the mean, unfeeling, selfish world, breaks in on the gay mistakes of the just expanding heart, which sees nothing but truth, and has nothing but happiness in prospect? I am not surprised that heathens raised altars to friendship. It was natural for untaught superstition to deify the source of every good. They worshipped friendship, which animates the moral world, on the same principle as they paid adoration to the sun, which gives life to the world of nature. I am summoned on board. Adieu. Ed Rivers. Kit Nusis is Edward Rivers. Letter 2. To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Quebec, June 27. I have this moment your letter, my dear. I am happy to hear my mother has been amused at Bath, and not at all surprised to find she rivals you in your conquests. By the way, I am not sure she is not handsomer, notwithstanding you tell me you are handsomer than ever. I am astonished she will lead a tall daughter about with her thus, to let people into a secret they would never suspect that she is past five-and-twenty. You are a foolish girl, Lucy. Do you think I have not more pleasure in continuing to my mother by coming hither the little indulgencies of life than I could have had by enjoying them myself? Pray reconcile her to my absence, and assure her she will make me happier by jovially enjoying the trifle I have assigned to her use than by procuring me the wealth of a nabob in which she was to have no share. But to return, you really, Lucy, ask me such a million of questions, tis impossible to know which to answer first. The country, the convents, the balls, the ladies, the beaux, 
"'Tis a history, not a letter you demand, and it will take me a twelve-month to satisfy your curiosity. Where shall I begin? Certainly with what must first strike a soldier. I have seen, then, the spot where the amiable hero expired in the arms of victory, have traced him step by step with equal astonishment and admiration. Tis here alone it is possible to form an adequate idea of an enterprise, the difficulties of which must have destroyed hope itself had they been foreseen. The country is a very fine one. You see here not only the beautiful, which it has in common with Europe, but the great sublime to an amazing degree. Every object here is magnificent. The very people seem almost another species, if we compare them with the French from whom they are descended. On approaching the coast of America, I felt a kind of religious veneration on seeing rocks which almost touched the clouds, covered with tall groves of pines that seemed coeval with the world itself, to which veneration the solemn silence not a little contributed. From Cape Rosiers up the river St. Lawrence, during a course of more than two hundred miles, there is not the least appearance of a human footstep. No objects meet the eye but mountains, woods, and numerous rivers, which seem to roll their waters in vain. It is impossible to behold a scene like this without lamenting the madness of mankind, who, more merciless than the fierce inhabitants of the howling wilderness, destroy millions of their own species in the wild contention for a little portion of that earth, the far greater part of which remains yet unpossessed, and courts the hand of labour for cultivation. The river itself is one of the noblest in the world. Its breadth is ninety miles at its entrance, gradually, and almost imperceptibly decreasing, interspersed with islands which give it a variety infinitely pleasing, and navigable near five hundred miles from the sea. Nothing can be more striking than the view of Quebec as you approach. It stands on the summit of a boldly rising hill, at the confluence of two very beautiful rivers, the St. Lawrence and St. Charles, and, as the convents and other public buildings first meet the eye, appears to have great advantage from the port. The island of Orleans, the distant view of the cascade of Montmorency, and the opposite village of Beauport, scattered with a pleasing irregularity along the banks of the river St. Charles, add greatly to the charms of the prospect. I have just had time to observe that the Canadian ladies have the vivacity of the French, with a superior share of beauty. As to balls and assemblies, we have none at present, it being a kind of interregnum of government. If I choose to give you the political state of the country, I could fill volumes with the poors and the contres, but I am not one of those sagacious observers who, by staying a week in a place, think themselves qualified to give not only its natural but its moral and political history. Besides which, you and I are rather too young to be very profound politicians. We are in expectation of a successor from whom we hope a new golden age. I shall then have better subjects for a letter to a lady. Adieu, my dear girl. Say everything for me to my mother. Yours, Ed Rivers. Letter 3 To Colonel Rivers at Quebec London, April 30th Indeed, gone to people the wilds of America, Ned, and multiply the human face divine. Tis a project worthy of a tall, handsome colonel of twenty-seven. Let me see. Five feet eleven inches, well made, with fine teeth, speaking eyes, a military air, and the look of a man of fashion. Spirit, generosity, a good understanding, some knowledge, an easy address, a compassionate heart, a strong inclination to the ladies, and, in short, every quality a gentleman should have. Excellent all these for colonization. Prenez garde, mes chers dames. You have nothing against you, Ned, but your modesty. A very useless virtue on French ground, or indeed on any ground. I wish you had a little more consciousness of your own merits. 
remember that to no one's self the oracle of apollo has pronounced to be the perfection of human wisdom our fair friend mrs h says colonel rivers wants nothing to make him the most agreeable man breathing but a little dash of the coxcomb for my part i hate humility in a man of the world tis worse than even the hypocrisy of the saints i am not ignorant and therefore never deny that i am a very handsome fellow and i have the pleasure to find all the women of the same opinion i am just arrived from paris the divine madame de blanc is as lovely and as constant as ever twas cruel to leave her but who can account for the caprices of the heart mine was the prey to a young unexperienced english charmer just come out of a convent the bloom of opening flowers ha huh, ned but i forget you are for the full-blown rose tis a happiness as we are friends that tis impossible we can ever be rivals a woman is grown out of my taste some years before she comes up to yours absolutely ned you are too nice for my part i am not so delicate youth and beauty are sufficient for me give me blooming seventeen and i cede to you the whole empire of sentiment this i suppose will find you trying the force of your destructive charms on the savage dames of america chasing females wild as the wind through woods as wild as themselves i see you pursuing the stately relict of some renowned indian chief some plump squaw arrived at the age of sentiment some warlike queen dowager of the ottawas or tuscaroras and pray comment trouver les dames sauvages all pure and genuine nature i suppose none of the affected coyness of europe your attention there will be the more obliging as the indian heroes i am told are not very attentive to the charms of the beau sex you are very sentimental on the subject of friendship no one has more exalted notions of this species of affection than myself yet i deny that it gives life to the moral world a gallant man like you might have found a more animating principle o oh, venus o oh, mer de l'amour i am most gloriously indolent this morning and would not write another line if the empire of the world observe i do not mean the female world depended upon it adieu j temple letter four to john temple esq pal mal quebec july the first tis very true jack i have no relish for the missus for puling girls and hanging sleeves who feel no passion but vanity and without any distinguishing taste are dying for the first man who tells them they are handsome take your boarding school girls but give me a woman one in short who has a soul not a cold inanimate form insensible to the lively impressions of real love and unfeeling as the wax baby she has just thrown away you will allow prior to be no bad judge of female merit and you may remember his egyptian maid the favourite of the luxurious king solomon is painted in full bloom by the way jack there is generally a certain hoity-toity inelegance of form and manner at seventeen which in my opinion is not balanced by freshness of complexion the only advantage girls have to boast of 
I have another objection to girls, which is that they will internally fancy every man they converse with has designs. A coquette and a prude in the bud are equally disagreeable. The former expects universal adoration. The latter is alarmed even at that general civility which is the right of all their sex. Of the two, however, the last is, I think, much the most troublesome. I wish these very apprehensive young ladies knew their virtue is not half so often in danger as they imagine, and that there are many male creatures to whom they may safely shew politeness, without being drawn into any concessions inconsistent with the strictest honour. We are not half such terrible animals as mamas, nurses, and nobles represent us, and if my opinion is of any weight, I am inclined to believe those tremendous men who have designed on the whole sex are, and ever were, characters as fabulous as the giants of romance. Women after twenty begin to know this, and therefore converse with us on the footing of rational creatures, without either fearing or expecting to find every man a lover. To do the ladies justice, however, I have seen the same absurdity in my own sex, and have observed many a very good sort of man turn pale at the politeness of an agreeable woman. I lament this mistake in both sexes, because it takes greatly from the pleasure of mixed society, and the only society for which I have any relish. Don't, however, fancy that, because I dislike the misses, I have a taste for their grandmothers. There is a golden mean, Jack, of which you seem to have no idea. You are very ill-informed as to the manners of the Indian ladies. Tis in the bud alone these wild roses are accessible. Liberal to profusion of their charms before marriage, they are chastity itself after. The moment they commence wives, they give up the very idea of pleasing, and turn all their thoughts to the cares, and those not the most delicate cares, of domestic life. Laborious, hardy, active, they plough the ground, they sow, they reap, whilst the haughty husband amuses himself with hunting, shooting, fishing, and such exercises only as are the image of war, all other employments being, according to his idea, unworthy the dignity of man. I have told you the labours of savage life, but I should observe that they are only temporary, and when urged by the sharp tooth of necessity, their lives are, upon the whole, idle beyond anything we can conceive. If the Epicurean definition of happiness is just, that it consists in indolence of body and tranquillity of mind, the Indians of both sexes are the happiest people on earth. Free from all care, they enjoy the present moment, forget the past, and are without solicitude for the future. In summer, stretched on the verdant turf, they sing, they laugh, they play, they relate stories of their ancient heroes to warm the youth to war. In winter, wrapped in the furs which bounteous nature provides them, they dance, they feast, and despise the rigours of the season, at which the more effeminate Europeans tremble. War being, however, the business of their lives, and the first passion of their souls, their very pleasures take their colours from it. Every one must have heard of the war dance, and their songs are almost all on the same subject. On the most diligent inquiry, I find but one love song in their language, which is short and simple, though perhaps not inexpressive. I love you, I love you dearly, I love you all day long. An old Indian told me they had also songs of friendship, but I could never procure a translation of one of them. On my pressing this Indian to translate one into French for me, he told me with a haughty air the Indians were not used to make translations, and that if I chose to understand their songs, I must learn their language. By the way, their language is extremely harmonious, especially as pronounced by their women, and is well adapted to music as Italian itself. I must not here omit an instance of their independent spirit, which is, that they never would submit to have the service of the church, though they profess the Romish religion, in any language but their own. The women, who have in general fine voices, sing in the choir with a taste and manner that would surprise you, and with a devotion that might edify more polished nations. The Indian women are tall and well-shaped, have good eyes, and before marriage are, except their colour and their coarse greasy black hair, very far from being disagreeable. But the laborious life they afterwards lead is extremely unfavourable to beauty. They become coarse and masculine, and lose in a year or two the power as well as the desire of pleasing. To compensate, however, for their loss of their charms, they acquire a new empire in marrying, are consulted in all affairs of state, choose a chief on every vacancy of the throne, are sovereign arbiters of peace and war, as well as of the fate of those unhappy captives that have the misfortune to fall into their hands, who are adopted as children, or put to the most cruel death, as the wives of the conquerors smile or frown. A Jesuit missionary told me a story on this subject which one cannot hear without horror. 
an indian woman with whom he lived on his mission was feeding her children when her husband brought in an english prisoner she immediately cut off his arm and gave her children the streaming blood to drink the jesuit remonstrated on the cruelty of the action on which looking sternly at him i would have them warriors said she and therefore feed them with the food of men this anecdote may perhaps disgust you with the indian ladies who certainly do not excel in female softness i will therefore turn to the canadian who have every charm except that without which all other charms are to me insipid i mean sensibility they are gay coquette and sprightly more gallant than sensible more flattered by the vanity of inspiring passion than capable of feeling into themselves and like their european countrywomen prefer the outward attentions of unmeaning admiration to the real devotion of the heart there is not perhaps on earth a race of females who talk so much or feel so little of love as the french the very reverse is in general true of the english my fair countrywomen seem ashamed of the charming sentiment to which they are indebted for all their power adieu i am going to attend a very handsome french lady who allows me the honour to drive her en calache to our canadian hyde park the road to st foy where you will see forty or fifty calashes with pretty women in them parading every evening you will allow the apology to be admissible ed rivers letter five to miss rivers clarges street quebec july four what an inconstant animal is man do you know lucy i begin to be tired of the lovely landscape around me i have enjoyed from it all the pleasure mere inanimate objects can give and find tis a pleasure that soon satiates if not relieved by others which are more lively the scenery is to be sure divine but one grows weary of mere scenery the most enchanting prospect soon loses its power of pleasing when the eye is accustomed to it we gaze at first transported on the charms of nature and fancy they will please for ever but alas it will not do we sigh for society the conversation of those dear to us the more animated pleasures of the heart there are fine women and men of merit here but as the affections are not in our power i have not yet felt my heart gravitate towards any of them i must absolutely set in earnest about my settlement in order to emerge from the state of vegetation into which i seem falling but to your last you ask me a particular account of the convents here have you an inclination my dear to turn nun if you have you could not have applied to a proper person my extreme modesty and reserve and my speaking french have made me already a great favourite with the older part of all the three communities who unanimously declare colonel rivers to be un très aimable homme and have given me an unlimited liberty of visiting them whenever i please they now and then treat me with a sight of some of the young ones but this is a favour not allowed to all the world there are three religious houses at quebec so you have choice the ursulines the hotel dieu and the general hospital the first is the severest order in the romish church except that very cruel one which denies its fair votaries the inestimable liberty of speech the house is large and handsome but has an air of gloominess with which the black habit and the livid paleness of the nuns extremely corresponds the church is contrary to the style of the rest of the convent ornamented and lively to the last degree the superior is an Englishwoman of good family who was taken prisoner by the savages when a child and placed here by the generosity of a french officer she is one of the most amiable women i ever knew with a benevolence in her countenance which inspires all who see her with affection i am very fond of her conversation though sixty and a nun the hotel dieu is very pleasantly situated with a view of the two rivers and the entrance of the port the house is cheerful airy and agreeable the habit extremely becoming a circumstance a handsome woman ought by no means to overlook tis white with a black gauze veil which would show your complexion to great advantage the order is much less severe than the ursulines and i might add much more useful the province being the care of the sick the nuns of this house are sprightly and have a look of health which is wanting at the ursulines the general hospital situated about a mile out of town on the borders of the river st charles is much the most agreeable of the three the order and the habit are the same with the hotel dieu except that to the habit is added the cross generally worn in europe by canonesses only a distinction procured for them by their founder saint valier 
the second bishop of Quebec. The house is, without, a very noble building, and neatness, elegance, and propriety reign within. The nuns who are all of the noblesse are many of them handsome, and all genteel, lively, and well-bred. They have an air of the world. Their conversation is easy, spirited, and polite. With them you almost forget the recluse and the woman of condition. In short, you have the best nuns at the Ursulines, the most agreeable women at the general hospital. All, however, have an air of chagrin, which they in vain endeavour to conceal. And the general eagerness with which they tell you unasked they are happy is a strong proof of the contrary. Though the most indulgent of all men to the follies of others, especially such as have their source in mistaken devotion, though willing to allow all the world to play the fool their own way, yet I cannot help being fired with a degree of zeal against an institution equally incompatible with public good and private happiness, an institution which cruelly devotes beauty and innocence to slavery, regret, and wretchedness, to a more irksome imprisonment than the severest laws inflict on the worst of criminals. Could anything but experience, my dear Lucy, make it believed possible that there should be rational beings who think they are serving the God of mercy by inflicting on themselves voluntary tortures, and cutting themselves off from that state of society in which he has placed them, and for which they were formed? By renouncing the best affections of the human heart, the tender names of friend, of wife, of mother, and, as far as in them lies, counter-working creation, by spurning from them every amusement, however innocent, by refusing the gifts of that beneficent power who made us to be happy, and destroying his most precious gifts, health, beauty, sensibility, cheerfulness, and peace. My indignation is yet awake from having seen a few days since, at the Ursulines, an extreme lovely young girl, whose countenance spoke a soul formed for the most lively, yet delicate, ties of love and friendship, led by a momentary enthusiasm, or perhaps by a childish vanity artfully excited, to the foot of those altars, which she will probably too soon bathe with the bitter tears of repentance and remorse. The ceremony, formed to strike the imagination and seduce the heart of unguarded youth, is extremely solemn and affecting. The procession of the nuns, the sweetness of their voices in the choir, the dignified devotion with which the charming enthusiasts received the veil, and took the cruel vow which shut her from the world for ever, struck my heart in spite of my reason, and I felt myself touched even to tears by a superstition I equally pity and despise. I am not, however, certain it was the ceremony which affected me thus strongly. It was impossible not to feel for this amiable victim. Never was there an object more interesting. Her form was elegance itself, her air and motion animated and graceful. The glow of pleasure was on her cheek, the fire of enthusiasm in her eyes, which are the finest I ever saw. Never did I see joy so livelily painted on the countenance of the happiest bride. She seemed to walk in air. Her whole person looked more than human an enemy to every species of superstition. I must, however, allow it to be least destructive to true virtue in your gentle sex, and therefore to be indulged with least danger. The superstition of men is gloomy and ferocious. It lights the fire and points the dagger of the assassin, whilst that of woman takes its colour from the sex, is soft, mild, and benevolent, exerts itself in acts of kindness and charity, and seems only substituting the love of God to that of man. Who can help admiring, whilst they pity, the foundress of the Ursuline convent, Madame de la Peltrie, to whom the very colony, in some measure, owes its existence, young, rich, and lovely, a widow in the bloom of life, mistress of her own actions. The world was gay before her, yet she left all the pleasures that world could give, to devote her days to the severities of a religion she thought the only true one. She dared the dangers of the sea, and the greater dangers of a savage people, she landed on an unknown shore, submitted to the extremities of cold and heat, of thirst and hunger, to perform a service she thought acceptable to the deity. To an action like this, however mistaken the motive, bigotry alone will deny praise. The man of candour will only lament that minds capable of such heroic virtue are not directed to views more conducive to their own and the general happiness. I am unexpectedly called this moment, my dear Lucy, on some business to Montreal, from whence you shall hear from me. Adieu. Ed Rivers. Letter 6 To Miss Rivers, Clarges Street, Montreal, July 9. I am arrived, my dear, and have brought my heart safe through such a continued fire as never poor knight-errant was exposed to. 
waited on at every stage by blooming country girls, full of spirit and coquetry, without any of the village bashfulness of England, and dressed like the shepherdesses of romance. A man of adventure might make a pleasant journey to Montreal. The peasants are ignorant, lazy, dirty, and stupid beyond all belief, but hospitable, courteous, civil, and, what is particularly agreeable, they leave their wives and daughters to do the honours of the house, in which obliging office they acquit themselves with an attention which, amidst every inconvenience apparent, though I am told not real, poverty can cause, must please every guest who has a soul inclined to be pleased. For my part, I was charmed with them, and eat my homely fare with as much pleasure as if I had been feasting on ortolans in a palace. Their conversation is lively and amusing. All the little knowledge of Canada is confined to the sex. Very few, even of the seigneurs, being able to write their own names. The road from Quebec to Montreal is almost a continued street, the villages being numerous, and so extended along the banks of the River St. Lawrence as to leave scarce a space without houses in view, except where here or there a river, a wood, or a mountain intervenes as if to give a more pleasing variety to the scene. I don't remember ever having had a more agreeable journey, the fine prospects of the day so enlivened by the gay chat of the evening that I was really sorry when I approached Montreal. The island of Montreal on which the town stands is a very lovely spot, highly cultivated and though less wild and magnificent, more smiling than the country round Quebec. The ladies, who seem to make pleasure their only business, and most of whom I have seen this morning driving about the town in calashes, and making what they call, the Tour de la Vie, attended by English officers, seem generally handsome, and have an air of sprightliness with which I am charmed. I must be acquainted with them all, for though my stay is to be short, I see no reason why it should be dull. I am told they are fond of little rural balls in the country, and intend to give one as soon as I have paid my respects in full. Six in the evening. I am just come from dining with the blank regiment and find I have a visit to pay I was not aware of to two English ladies who are a few miles out of town. One of them is wife to the major of the regiment, and the other just going to be married to a captain in it, Sir George Clayton, a young handsome baronet, just come to his title and a very fine estate by the death of a distant relation. He is at present at New York, and I am told they are to be married as soon as he comes back. Eight o'clock. I have been making some flying visits to the French ladies, though I have not seen many beauties, yet in general the women are handsome. Their manner is easy and obliging, they make the most of their charms by their vivacity, and I certainly cannot be displeased with their extreme partiality for the English officers. Their own men, who indeed are not very attractive, have not the least chance for any share in their good graces. Thursday morning. I am just setting out with a friend for Major Melmoth's to pay my compliments to the two ladies. I have no relish for this visit. I hate misses that are going to be married. They are always so full of the dear man that they have not common civility to other people. I am told, however, both the ladies are agreeable. Fourteenth, eight in the evening. Agreeable? Lucy, she's an angel. Tis happy for me she's engaged. Nothing else could secure my heart, of which you know I am very tenacious. Only think of finding beauty, delicacy, sensibility, all that can charm in woman, hid in a wood in Canada. You say I am given to be enthusiastic in my approbations, but she is really charming. I am resolved not only to have a friendship for her myself, but that you shall, and have told her so. She comes to England as soon as she is married. You are formed to love each other. But I must tell you, Major Melmoth kept us a week at his house in the country, in one continued round of rural amusements, by which I do not mean hunting and shooting, but such pleasures as the ladies could share, little rustic balls and parties round the neighbouring country, in which parties were joined by all the fine women at Montreal. Miss Melmoth is a very pleasing, genteel brunette, but Emily Montague... You will say I am in love with her if I describe her, and yet I declare to you I am not, knowing she loves another, to whom she is soon to be united. I see her charms with the same kind of pleasure I do yours, a pleasure which, though extremely lively, is by our situation, without the least mixture of desire. I have said she is charming. There are men here who do not think so, but to me she is loveliness itself. My ideas of beauty are perhaps a little out of the common road. I hate a woman of whom every man coldly says— she is handsome. I adore beauty. But it is not mere features or complexion to which I give that name. Tis life, tis spirit, tis animation. Tis, in one word, tis Emily Montague. Without being regularly beautiful, she charms every sensible heart. All other women, however lovely, appear marble statues near her. Fair, pale, a paleness which gives the idea of delicacy without destroying that of health. With dark hair and eyes, 
the latter large and languishing. She seems made to feel, to a trembling excess, the passion she cannot fail of inspiring. Her elegant form has an air of softness and languor, which seizes the whole soul in a moment. Her eyes, the most intelligent I ever saw, hold you enchained by their bewitching sensibility. There are a thousand unspeakable charms in her conversation, but what I am most pleased with is the attentive politeness of her manner, which you seldom see in a person in love, the extreme desire of pleasing one man generally taking off greatly from the attention due to all the rest. This is partly owing to her admirable understanding, and partly to the natural softness of her soul, which gives her the strongest desire of pleasing. As I am a philosopher in these matters, and have made the heart my study, I want extremely to see her with her lover, and to observe the gradual increase of her charms in his presence. Love, which embellishes the most unmeaning countenance, must give to hers a fire irresistible. What eyes! when animated by tenderness. The very soul acquires a new force and beauty by loving. A woman of honour never appears half so amiable, or displays half so many virtues, as when sensible to the merit of a man who deserves her affection. Observe, Lucy, I shall never allow you to be handsome till I hear you are in love. Did I tell you Emily Montague had the finest hand and arm in the world? I should, however, have expected yours. Her tone of voice, too, has the same melodious sweetness a perfection without which the loveliest woman could never make the least impression on my heart. I don't think you are very unlike upon the whole, except that she is paler. You know, Lucy, you have often told me I should certainly have been in love with you if I had not been your brother. This resemblance is a proof you are right. You are really as handsome as any woman can be whose sensibility has never been put in motion. I am to give a ball to-morrow. Mrs. Melmoth is to have the honours of it, but as she is with child she does not dance. This circumstance has produced a dispute not a little flattering to my vanity. The ladies are making interest to dance with me. What a happy exchange have I made! What man of common sense would stay to be overlooked in England who can have rival beauties contend for him in Canada? This important point is not yet settled. The etiquette here is rather difficult to adjust. As to me, I have nothing to do in the consultation. My hand is destined to the longest pedigree. We stand prodigiously in our noblesse at Montreal. Four o'clock. After a dispute in which two French ladies were near drawing their husbands into a duel, the point of honour is yielded by both to Miss Montague, each insisting only that I should not dance with the other. For my part, I submit with a good grace, as you will suppose. Saturday morning. I never passed a more agreeable evening. We have our amusements here, I assure you. A set of fine young fellows and handsome women, all well dressed and in humour with themselves and with each other. My lovely Emily, like Venus among the graces, only multiplied to about sixteen. Nothing is, in my opinion, so favourable to the display of beauty as a ball. A state of rest is ungraceful. All nature is most beautiful in motion. Trees agitated by the wind, a ship under sail, a horse in the course, a fine woman dancing. Never any human being had such an aversion to still life as I have. I'm going back to Melmoth's for a month. Don't be alarmed, Lucy. I see all her perfections, but I see them with the cold eye of admiration only. A woman engaged loses all her attractions as a woman. There is no love without a ray of hope. My only ambition is to be her friend. I want to be the confidant of her passion. With what spirit such a mind as hers must love. Adieu, my dear. Yours, Ed Rivers. End of Letters 1 through 6